Hi, everyone. So thank you for coming today. Welcome. This is our second Meet a Neuroscientist event. Uh, my name is Parzad. I work for the Harvard Brain Science Initiative. And we've put together this series to give high school students and college students like you a chance to meet with some of the neuro researchers in our community, uh, graduate students, postdocs, and faculty members. Um, and we used to do this a couple of years ago in person in the summers, and it was a lot of fun. Um, and we decided to create a virtual version so that we can reach students across the country. So thank you so much for coming. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about our speakers. Uh, the plan for today is uh, to hear two short talks, um, which will be recorded. And then after the recording, uh, I'll turn off the recording and we'll have a long uh, opportunity for a QA. and uh, So I just wanna tell you a little bit about our speakers. Uh, we have Olivia Rose and Jeff Holt. Uh, Olivia Rose is a visiting graduate student. She works in the lab of Carlos Ponce, which is in the neurobiology department at Harvard Medical School. Um, she is a neuroscience graduate student um, through the Wash U School of Medicine program in neuroscience. Olivia studies how the primate brain excels at recognizing faces and objects. Um, and she focuses on understanding visual properties in, of brain cells in an area of the brain called the prefrontal cortex. Uh, she went to school at Florida State University, and she's really passionate about outreach. Um, and our second speaker is Jeff Holt, who is a professor of otolaryngology and neurology at Boston Children's Hospital and Harvard Medical School. Uh, Jeff studies auditory neuroscience, which is the science of how we hear. His lab studies uh, proteins and genes of the inner ear, um, which work to take uh, the sounds you hear and trans tr transform them into electrical signals uh, that signal into your brain. Uh, he fell in love with neuroscience during his undergraduate years. He went to school at Wofford College in South Carolina. Um, then he did some graduate work at the University of Rochester in neurophysiology um, and postdoctoral training at Mass General Hospital in Harvard. Um, and both of our speakers will tell you more a little about their science and also about their education and career journeys. Um, I just wanted to note, if you think of a question, feel free to type it into the chat box at any time during the talks uh, so you don't forget it. Um, yeah, and with that, I think we can get started. Awesome, thank you so much for that introduction, Parizad. Um, all right, let's get to the fun stuff. So um, I titled this talk um, after a quote that one of my professors in undergrad told me when I really, really, really wanted to go into research as a field. And I was one of those students that wanted to do it all right now, right away. And he reminded me, Olivia, little steps for little feet. So this talk is going to outline you know, my current work and the little steps that it took to get me there. Um, like Parzad mentioned, I am a PhD candidate in neuroscience through the Washington University School of Medicine. Six months ago, our lab had the amazing opportunity to move to Harvard Medical School and become integrated with the community. So I am loving my time here so far. Um, and I'm just continuing on with my research. So without further ado, pop quiz. Hope y'all studied. What is this? Type it in the chat. This is not a trick question, by the way. Yep, I see some chat notifications. Yep, dog, dog, dog. How fast did it take for you to recognize that this is a dog? Like instantly, right? Let me explain to you why this is such a cool property of the brain by going into a little bit of, of neuroscience behind vision. So you may not know that our brains literally construct our entire visual experience, even though it seems absolutely instant to us. We look at a picture the, or, or a real, the, the real world, photons of light hit the retina and become transformed into electrical signals that the brain can read. Those are then sent through a sensory relay station and somewhere further down in the, in the middle of the brain, um, and then get sent to the cortex, which is a, the newer part of the brain that everybody knows, um, does a lot of really interesting higher order stuff that help us be human. And so this processing pathway is called the ventral visual pathway. And it starts with just selectivity for lines. And then as you move down this highly hierarchical pathway, you see selectivity for more and more complex visual features emerge. 
until finally, in an area of the brain called inferior temporal cortex, we start seeing neurons respond to highly complex images like faces or like my dog, Rusty. Okay, this is super cool and everything, right? But it begs the question, how are we so good at visual recognition and so fast if we are constructing it on a moment by moment basis, starting with just simple, simple, simple lines into something that is seamlessly our entire percept of the whole world? Well, we address this question by um, pairing visual neurons from the primate cortex with cutting edge machine learning. And it's gonna sound like science fiction, but this allows the neurons to show us what they encode. So this sort of high tech, super futuristic sci-fi technique was piloted and um, developed by my PI and amazing mentor, Dr. Carlos Ponce. And let me show you what, let me show you what uh, pictures inside neurons look like. So, this is from our recent work that just got published a couple months ago. If we're recording from primary visual cortex, we see that under guidance of these neurons, the types of shapes that are generated are these simple lines and very, 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 um, very comparable shapes to the ones that I showed you on the previous slide, where it was like a line of different orientations. And we know from previous research that these neurons respond best to those kinds of very simplistic stimuli. As we move to a more intermediate area in the brain, we see more complex shapes emerge like curvature and we start seeing more color. And then finally, when we get to inferior temporal cortex, we see pictures that aren't photorealistic, but they're highly, highly, highly reminiscent of things that we see in our world. So we see shapes that look highly reminiscent of faces or fruits like this guy right here that we call our, our little apple neuron. And basically this gives us a direct insight into how the primate cortex encodes sensory information, particularly visual information. I'm not gonna go into too many details about the exact machine learning process because that's a lot and I could spend the entire 15 minutes just talking about that process, um, but it's highly, highly robust and it works extremely well and ends up exceeding the, um, it does better than real world images or natural or usual stimuli that people have traditionally used throughout visual neuroscience since the 50s. Okay, so where do I come into the picture? I'm, I'm a visual neuroscientist who has very little interest in visual cortex, which is a little counterintuitive. I'm interested in how the primate brain applies vision and uses it for goal-directed behavior. And so I study this area that's quite far away from the rest of the ventral visual pathway. It's this area called ventral lateral prefrontal cortex. And the reason I study it is it's got very, very strong anatomical projections with visual areas like inferotemporal cortex. Okay, so what do visual representations in this area look like? It's a good question because everybody who has studied this region has primarily looked at it in terms of tasks. So we know that prefrontal cortex is perfectly suited for tasks and higher order goal-directed behavior, but we don't really understand how sensory representations are used for those behaviors. So my thesis research concentrates on that very, very specific process in this area of prefrontal cortex. And in doing so, I look at the visual representations in this area. So do you want to see, want to see representations from prefrontal cortex? We see things that are, again, highly reminiscent of real world images. So the picture on the left was um, a stimulus that was generated under neuronal guidance from a neuron in ventrolateral prefrontal cortex. And the picture on the right with the, with the mom and the baby monkey was immediately following that experiment, the top image out of a set of several hundred that that neuron selected for. And as you can see on the bottom, this is the, this is the time course of our machine learning, um, closed loop machine learning process, capturing those specific features that that neuron wants to look at. And it starts with just textures and it builds over time. It drives up the response of the neuron and we end up generating stimuli that exceed the responses to any natural photograph or laboratory stimulus that we could otherwise show it. So how did I end up pulling pictures out of monkey's brains? I didn't start here. I started as a psychology major at Florida State University. 
I'm the first in my in my family to attend graduate school and only the second to get my bachelor's. So it was a learning process. And finally, I ended up at Washington University School of Medicine for my PhD. And then halfway through my PhD, Carlos told me that we were going to be moving to the birthplace of visual neuroscience, Harvard Medical School. So the short answer is how I got from Florida State University to pulling pictures out of monkeys' brains was the fact that I just started doing research in undergrad. I showed enthusiasm. I emailed professors. I started out cleaning EEG gel out of caps and doing that for hours and hours and hours and hours. And then finally was able to show, hey, I'm a reliable student and I'm interested in learning more of the science. And so I was given a little bit more responsibility. And over the course of my two years in that very first research position, I went from scrubbing EEG gel out of caps to actually administering the EEG myself and learning how to start pre-processing data for analysis. Now, this culminated in the end of graduate school in an independent research project where I was able to get my own approval to work with um, clinical populations that were under the age of 18. I got several thousand dollars worth of undergraduate grant funding. And I ended up winning several awards for this project to study how, um, uh, to study a neural correlate of uh, a movement disorder called Tourette syndrome, which you may or may not be familiar with. And basically my advice throughout this whole thing is just put yourself out there, participate in research, ask questions, go to seminars, sorry for the barking, <laughs> um, go to seminars, and show your enthusiasm for this subject. We are a bunch of nerds who love talking about our research. Come talk to us, show your enthusiasm, ask us questions, and we'll wanna get you involved. When I'm looking for students to bring into the lab, I don't even care so much about your qualifications. You can literally cold email me and say, I loved your paper that just came out. Can we chat about it? And I will be absolutely thrilled and probably seek to bring you into the lab. But. If you can't get any research experience in undergrad, some universities are better suited towards research than others, you can always start doing that after you graduate with a full-time research tech position. So hope is not lost. There's lots of opportunities out there. The bottom line is show that you're enthusiastic, show that you're passionate about the science and that you've done your research, show that you're a team player, and most importantly, don't forget, Little steps for little feet. <laughs> Thank you for that right. fabulous talk, Olivia. Thank you. I want to save more than enough time for Jeff, but also um, I will open it up if there's any specific questions that somebody wants to ask about my research or just, you know, general things like how did you get to, you know, like, hey, you know, this is this is a little bit too much of like draw the rest of the owl. Like, come on, how did you get from scrubbing EEG gel to being a Harvard neuroscientist? Like, you know, I didn't go into full details like that. So if you have more questions, please open it up. Let's chat. <laughs> So I just have a quick question, maybe not quick, but so you said that the brain like um, builds upon the textures that they see. Is that the same as in an infant as you see in like uh, an adult? That is a fantastic question. So um, I'm going to I'm going to spitball a little bit here because I'll be honest, I haven't done too terribly much in terms of visual development myself. But our close collaborator at the School of Medicine, Marge Livingstone, she's awesome, love her to death. Um, she actually studies visual development in infant monkeys. And so she does some really cool things that, um, like she'll raise monkeys without, like from, from the time that they're born, um, without exposure to faces. So basically anybody interacting with them wears like a face shield that blocks it. And then she then records from these areas of the brain that we know encode faces and find that they're completely reorganized. They no longer are encoding for faces, they're encoding for the next most informative thing, which is hands. Because the hands of the researchers are the ones that are giving them food and treats and scratches and all of that good stuff. Um, in terms of general visual development like that, I know there are some differences between infants, but without doing a full lit search, I can't tell you more specifics than that. <laughs> but fantastic question. Great. Thank you. Thank you. And we have two questions in the chat. Um, so one question is, uh, what resources did you find helpful as a first generation student who was figuring out the undergraduate slash graduate school processes for the first time? 
literally trial and error and making those kinds of relationships with my professors. Um, so I was the kind of student where, you know, I would go into office hours and I would chat, you know, about their research and I would try to get into questions and I'd be like, can you please give me more resources to learn more um, and started building relationships in that way. So then it became when it became time for me to apply for graduate schools. I had these, you know, I probably had like six, you know, people that were, you know, ten tenured or tenure track professors at my university doing research full time that were able to help guide me through that process where I didn't necessarily have somebody at home who could help me with that. Um, but most of it is going to be networking's a big thing um, and just reading papers and reaching out to people. That's like networking is probably a good solid 80% of, of science. Which is not fun if you're an introvert. <laughs> yeah, and a couple more questions in the chat. Uh, so how did you start? How did you choose monkeys after getting the Tourette's grant? Um, and also, how did you choose to go into psychology? When did you know you wanted to go into this field? <laughs> Excellent question. So um, I'm a, my background is probably a little bit different from the general um, trend that you see from people and hear from people that are trying to enter science. Um, I was never one of those kids that was particularly interested in science. I like books. I started out undergrad as an English major and I'm like, I'm going to be a published poet. This is what I want to do with my life, right? Um, and clearly that didn't happen. So <laughs> um, basically what changed for me was the fact that I, um, as a, so I got a scholarship for undergrad and one of the contingencies of my scholarship was that I had to participate in the undergraduate research opportunity program. And they had non-STEM research, but I'm like, you know what, if I'm gonna do research, I'm gonna do something out of the box, let's do psychology. And that kind of opened up the floodgates for me when I was actually working in that lab, I realized that I loved it, I was passionate about it. And that was, you know, I wanted to study the brain. And so my university at the time did not offer a neuroscience major. And so my two alternatives were psychology or biology. And the biology major had one neuro class. So I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to major in psychology. <laughs> Basically, that's what I did. I took other classes in biology and chemistry. And I worked in neuroscience research labs. And I went to seminars. And I bugged professors about their research. And I read all the time. And I just tried to get an understanding of this field. Um, when I initially started, I thought that I wanted specifically to study movement disorders. And then as I kind of grew throughout my research process, I realized that the question that was most interesting to me was how, especially in disordered behavior, but I don't study disorders, how do we get from the sensory input to a disordered behavioral output? And movement disorders are super cool. Um, it's super cool broken systems to study under that. Because, um, so like I have, I have motor tics. And for me, when I wear a face mask for COVID, it makes my tics bad. We don't understand why, it just does. And so that link between sensory input and behavior is a lot closer than most people give it credit towards. And so once I realized that my interest was not necessarily in the movement itself, it was the things that were leading into the disordered movement. And that's kind of what broke open my whole um, entry into sensory neuroscience. And then with the whole monkey thing, it was literally I um, rotated in Carlos's lab and I realized after working primarily with human research, I wanted to work with a different kind of primate. So now I work with non-human primates. That's great. Thank you for the great questions. Uh, so uh, Louisa, you have your hand up. Yeah, uh, thanks, Olivia. That was a great talk. Um, you mentioned that you uh, do research mostly with primates. I was just wondering if you had any interest or if you ever done research with rodent models before. Yes, so I researched in a rodent lab. Um, it wasn't mice or rats. It was a type of rodent called a prairie vole. If you guys are familiar with that from class, they're the, the cute little things. They look like hamsters and they pair bond. And so they're a great model organism for studying social interactions and attachment. So I did work in a, in a rodent lab in undergrad. It was all immunohistochemistry and pipetting. And I realized one, I'm not good at pipetting and two, I don't like pipetting. <laughs> and so for me, I preferred to be in a dry lab as opposed to a wet lab. And so I intentionally chose either neuroimaging or electrophysiology labs after that. Thank you. Thank you. 
Hey, we have another question in the chat. So I'll read this one out loud and then perhaps we'll segue to Jeff's talk and then take more questions uh, for everyone together. So question from Victoria, how did you go about finding the right PhD program? Ah, very good question. So like I said, when I started, um, when I started my, my career, my, especially my graduate training, I thought that I was going to study specifically movement disorders. So I initially joined WashU because they're one of the leading centers in movement disorder research, specifically for tick disorders. Um, and so I went initially to join with a PI. Um, his name is Kevin Black. He's absolutely amazing and brilliant and wonderful. I just figured out where I'm rotating in his lab that MRI research was not quite the right thing for me. I preferred working with electrophysiology data as opposed to just constantly processing structural MRI data. It wasn't the right fit for me. Um, rotating in Carlos's lab was kind of the turning point for me um, in terms of actually opening up my area. But in terms of picking the right graduate program for you, I am case in point. Um, the example of why when you start grad school it's not necessarily where you're going to end up in grad school so if you're picking a program specifically for one professor you might change your mind you might not but you can always change your mind so the big thing to look you know to look for um is well, aside from just like, you know, making sure that there's PIs there that are doing the kind of research that you want and more than one, you want to have your options of people that would be good mentors. Um, but then on top of that, you want to look at things like cost of living and general attitude. Are the grad students when you're interviewing at a program happy or do they look like they hate their life and they're, you know, perpetually sleep deprived and their bags under their eyes? Um, basically, you want to prioritize, you know, your well-being. Um, in addition to this higher level of education that you're pursuing. So some programs are a little bit better about fostering that. Um, you can also look at things like your stipend um, as compared to the cost of living. So when I joined Washington University in St. Louis, my very meager little graduate stipend took me very far in the Midwest. In Boston, it does not go as far. Do with that information what you will if you decide to go to a university in a big city. Um, yeah, just honestly, just look for PIs that are doing the kind of research that you want. Talk to them and people in their labs. Try to figure out if they're actually a good mentor and not just a good scientist, because the mentorship component is key. And all in all, just know that it's not a matter of where you go, it's what you do with it. So don't get too narrowed in on trying to go to the top, top, top school. For all you know, you might be passing up an opportunity that's even that's an even better learning opportunity for yourself. That's great. Thank you so much. We have a, a bunch of uh, other questions, but I'm thinking perhaps we can move to Jeff's talk and then take questions together just to make sure we have uh, time for a lengthy Q&A. Um, yes, so thank you so much and uh, we'll get started with Jeff's talk. Okay, can you guys see my screen? Great. Yes. Thanks, Pari, for the introduction. And thanks, Olivia, for that opening talk. That was really terrific and great to hear your story. So I guess I'll give you a little bit more background on, on where I came from and how I got to my point in, in my career. Um, I grew up in South Carolina, a small little town in South Carolina. My mom is here. She's actually in this town in South Carolina at the moment. Um, I went to a public high school there and there was not a lot of science going on. Um, after graduating from high school, I went to a local small liberal arts school. It was called Wofford College, about 1200 students. And you know, I kind of drifted around amongst a few different fields, um, trying to explore my interests, but ended up majoring in biology. Biology was just, fascinating to me. I really enjoyed the topic and enjoyed learning about the biology. Most of my peers were pre-med, but for me, I knew that's not what I wanted to do. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but for me, it, it just wasn't my thing. My dad was a, a physician and, and he loved seeing patients, but he also talked a lot about all the paperwork and all the red tape. And he spent half his time dealing with insurance companies and things like that. And that didn't appeal as much. 
but I knew I liked the science that I was learning. I liked the biology. And so after graduating, I actually went and taught high school biology for two years. So, so I did that um, at a, a small school in South Carolina. And it was really then that I began to realize that teaching science and being involved in science was something that I was passionate about and something that I thought I could build a career around. And so I, I liked it at the high school level, but I realized I wanted to go deeper and I wanted to teach at the college level. And so that's when I began looking at graduate schools and I applied to a few different graduate schools. I ended up going to the University of Rochester and studied neurophysiology there. And so from there, um, I did a postdoc after graduation here in Boston. My first faculty position was at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville, Virginia. I was there for 10 years. That was a great place to be. And I've been here at Boston uh, running a research lab at Boston Children's Hospital and Harvard Medical School for about 10 years. And so it's, it's been a, a great path. I really enjoyed it. I, I love my job. Um, any of you who are interested in neuroscience as a career, I would definitely encourage you to, to look at it closely. There, there's a lot of great things to be done. So let me jump into uh, my talk here. Let's see, I'm going to change this to a laser pointer. So there's a lot of different ways to think about the brain. And one of them is simply to think of it as a big black box, right? So there's a lot of amazing things going on inside this black box, a lot that, that we do know about, but a lot of things we don't know about. You know, everything, every thought that you've ever had happens inside this box, every emotion you felt, every action that you perform begins within this black box. There's a lot of mystery here still, right? We, we've made incredible progress over the past several years, but I think it's no, uh, no surprise that there's far more that, that we don't know than that we do know. And so when you're thinking about science and you come across something that you don't know, that science doesn't know, this is actually an opportunity, right? So you as emerging scientists, whenever you hear that there's something that's not known in science, I want you to begin thinking about it as, hey, this is an opportunity for discovery, an opportunity for you to contribute to the expanding body of human knowledge, right? And this box here is really full of opportunity because there's so much that we don't know. And so if we peek inside, just to give you a sense of how complex it is inside this black box, in the brain, there's a hundred billion neurons, right? And if we take a section of that and look deeper at some of these individual neurons here is, is through the sensory cortex, we can look at individual neurons. Each neuron has about a thousand synapses. So that means if there's a hundred billion neurons, each with on average about a thousand synapses, that's a hundred trillion synapses. And digging deeper, each one of those synapses has a receptor, a neurotransmitter receptor. In fact, there's about a thousand receptors on average, some a little more, some a little less, but on a, about a thousand on average. So that's a hundred quadrillion receptors. That's getting pretty complex, right? And each one of these receptors can exist in either an open state when it binds neurotransmitter or a closed state. When it's open, it lets a small electrical current flow into the cell. And so this is a binary system, right? It's open or closed. And so thinking about it as a binary system, the number of different states in the brain would be two raised to the power of a hundred quadrillion. That's a mind blowing number, I don't know. I don't, my calculator couldn't calculate that. It, it crashed when I tried to do the math. And of course, it's even more complex than that because there's a huge variety of different neurotransmitters and neurotransmitter receptors. And this is all changing moment by moment. So the complexity within the human brain is, is just truly mind boggling. Lots of opportunity for discovery here. And so for me personally, to try to get my head around what's going inside this black box, I really feel like I wanted to start at the beginning. How does information get into this box? And of course that is through the sensory systems. The sensory systems all have the job of taking what's in the external world, stimuli from the external world, 
converting that into an electrochemical signal that can be transmitted to the brain to drive perception and subsequent behaviors. The, the eye is converting visual stimuli into electrical signals, the tongue, tasted molecules into these electrical signals, the nose, the ear, etc. This is a major focus of sensory neuroscience, trying to understand the molecules, the genes and proteins involved and the mechanisms of how these stimuli, information in the stimuli are converted into electrical signals. And this has been a focus for 50 years or so now, and we've made some, some important progress. In the case of vision, the Nobel Prize was awarded in 1967 for identifying the molecules that lead to sensory transduction in the visual system. In the nose, there was a Nobel Prize for the sense of smell in 2004. And just last year, the Nobel Prize went to the sense of touch for how touch molecules, touch and temperature are converting into electrical signals. Interestingly, the auditory system has not been recognized in this way because it's been a very challenging system to understand. And this is really where my lab has been focused, trying to understand the ear and what the molecules are that convert sound information into electrical signals. And so that all begins with the sensory hair cells of the inner ear. This is kind of a misnomer. It's called a hair cell. It doesn't have anything to do with the hair on your head, but it's got this tuft of modified microvilli that forms a mechanosensitive organelle that sits on top of the cell. And so within the human auditory system, this spiral shaped cochlea, there's about 16,000 of these sensory hair cells. And there's another 30,000 within the organs of balance that are shown right here. And so human inner ears are not easy to access, right? Nobody wants to give these up for our experiments. So we end up using the mouse as a model system. The mouse has wonderful genetics. We can look at the genetics of the mouse, but it turns out the anatomy of the inner ear, which you can see right here, is actually quite similar. And when you get down to the cellular and the genetic level, it's remarkably similar to what's going on in humans. So we can excise the tissue from a mouse. And here we have the sensory hair cells. There's four rows of them, inner hair cells, outer hair cells. I've colored the cell bodies in blue right here. And we can zoom in on a single hair cell. So this is the apical surface, the top surface of the cell with modified microvilli. And we can study these electrophysiologically. So what we'll do is excise these cells. We can wiggle the hair bundles back and forth, plot the position of the hair bundle, and then measure an electrical response. And so if you've had high school physics, you know about voltages and currents and resistors. And so these are currents that are flowing into the cell. And it's this process that initiates the auditory response in the ear. But trying to understand exactly what's going on here has been our focus. And so if we blow up a single pair of these modified microvilli here on the right, it turns out there's this interesting little apparatus. When this swings back and forth, this mechanosensitive ion channel opens and closes. You can see this opening. And when it's open, there are cations that flow into the cell primarily calcium and potassium. And because these are charged ions, this generates the electrical current that gets transmitted to the brain and drives the perception of sound. And so identifying the genes and proteins that encode for this structure has been our focus. And we know that this little thing right here is called a tip link. It's composed of proteins labeled here. This is an adaptation motor composed of a myosin molecule. And this ion channel right here has been a big question mark in the field, and people have been searching for it for about 40 years. But I can jump ahead and tell you that I, I feel really fortunate that our lab has been able to contribute to this, and we've identified that this ion channel is formed by a protein known as TMC1. This is the structure, a model of, of what we think this protein looks like. And so in this orientation, this would be the outside of the cell up here. This is the inside of the cell. And right down through the center pathway formed by these blue alpha helices would be the pore region where ions would flow into the cell. And if I put this in motion, hopefully you can see that. So this is the pore region right here through the center. And so we've identified this TMC1 protein as being required for hair cell transduction. 
And so we can take away that question mark, replace it with TMC1. And, and this basic discovery has really taken about 10 years of work in our lab. Um, we've been interested in that in addition, not only because of the basic science, which has been fascinating, but also because this gene carries at least 100 different mutations that cause hearing loss in humans. And so I've mapped those out. This is the gene structure shown here in each one of the different mutations that cause either recessive or dominant forms of hearing loss. And so we've realized through our basic science discovery that we actually have an opportunity to help patients and maybe develop and design therapeutics that could one day restore hearing for, for these patients who have genetic hearing loss. And so the strategy we're pursuing is to use an, a viral vector. It's known as an AAV, adeno-associated viral vector. And these can encode green fluorescent protein. And we can inject these vectors that encode green fluorescent protein or GFP into the inner ear. And we see hundreds of hair cells glowing green. So this tells us that the vector is working. It's targeting the sensory cells of the ear. It's delivering the DNA and the cells are expressing that DNA to make GFP. It's a great tool, GFP, and here at high magnification, you can see the individual cells. This is really highly efficient. We can get 95 to 100% of the hair cells targeted with this approach. And so we wanna do more than just turn cells green. You know, This makes pretty pictures, but the, the goal is to use the TMC1 coding sequence. We can take the healthy DNA sequence package that into the viral vectors, and then inject those into the ears. And we use mice that carry TMC1 mutations. These are mice that lack sensory transduction. So in this case, a mouse that lacks any responses here, it's got a TMC1 mutation. So this animal would be completely deaf. But if we inject a TMC1 gene therapy into these animals, we can restore, restore these mechanical responses. So this is, again, wiggling bundles back and forth. We see the elect, electrical activity return. We can also do something called an auditory brainstem response. And in this case, we put a scalp electrode on the back of the head of the mouse and play louder and louder sounds into the ears of the mouse. And for a mouse that carries a TMC1 mutation, these flat lines with louder and louder sounds indicate that these animals are completely deaf. The responses on the right are from a normal hearing mouse, and you see these squiggly lines. This is the electrical activity being transmitted to the brain. And you see right here, this particular trace is at about 25 to 30 decibels. So that's the auditory threshold for a normal hearing mouse. But if we take one of these TMC mutant deaf mice, introduce our AAV gene therapy, we can restore the responses with thresholds back to wild type levels in some cases. And so we can also map this out as a function of frequency on the x-axis, low pitch sounds here at the left, high pitch sounds at the right with the thresholds on this axis. And so again, across the entire frequency range, these TMC mice are completely deaf. The thresholds for wild type mice are shown just here. And over the years, we've gotten better and better at this. In 2015, when we first did it, we were able to restore some function. With newer vectors in 2019, we got better. Last year, 2021, it was looking better still. And as of today, we're getting thresholds that are equivalent to those of wild type, particularly at this low frequency end. So we think that this really has a chance to uh, restore function in human patients. And that's kind of where we are right now. We hope within the next couple of years that this work can be, um, be translated for use in clinic, in clinical trials. And so coming back to this, this black box idea, um, I mentioned that there's you know, just so much opportunity in trying to understand what's going on in the brain. And I think this is a really exciting time to be involved in neuroscience. You know, we're looking for, for people to join the neuroscience research effort. We want a diversity of ideas. We want people from all sorts of backgrounds that just helps us accelerate and think about things from different perspectives. We want people who are smart, motivated, and, and friendly. And, and friendly, I wanna emphasize, is, is a key part of it because nobody's gonna solve this black box on their own. We really work in teams, right? And we want people who can work together in teams to help solve what's going on inside this black box and understand neuroscience. 
So I'm gonna stop here and just show you a picture of the folks on my team. We have a great group who work here in the lab that includes uh, graduate students, postdocs, we've got undergraduate students, we've got a couple of high school students who have contributed. So there's always opportunity for people who are excited to work on this kind of thing. And I've left our lab website if you wanna learn more about this, as well as my email. If you ever wanna reach out, I'd be happy to hear from you. And so I'll stop there and I hope we still have time for questions, Pari. Thank you so much. It was a fabulous talk, really exciting data. I'm gonna turn off our recording here. Um, and yes, we definitely